Uh, hello, everyone. Today we will begin reading um, um, the the young um, the young lords um, a radical history. But as always, we will begin with the statement of unity, so everyone can understand where we stand. So I'm gonna start screen sharing the statement of unity right now. Hope everyone can see this. All right. Hope, hope, hope everyone can see that good. I'll begin reading the same of unity preface. <clears throat> the U.S. was founded as a, as a colonial settler state based upon white supremacy and slavery, stealing the lands of the indigenous nations, breaking every treaty made with them, and confining them to quote-unquote reservations, concentration camps. As the country became more powerful, the eagle sunk its claws into other nations, making war on Mexico and grabbing its northern territory its northern territory, invading Cuba, Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and the Philippines, and either annexing them outright or making them colonies or neo-colonies. And, in the 20th century, it became the major imperialist power in the world, exploiting both the people within its boundaries and those in every other country, bullying them with military interventions, and robbing them of their right to self-determination. As C.P. Newton stated, quote, we have two enemies to fight, racism and capitalism, unquote. Between the two, capitalism is primary. Racism is a byproduct of capitalism. The working people of the world, of every ethnicity or nationality, face a common enemy that's destroying life on Earth. Our enemy is a small ruling class of property owners controlling most of the world's wealth and resources. We must have our basic needs met to live a good and meaningful life. Food, shelter, health care, education, freedom for the oppression of the state, and peace with other nations. To obtain these essential things for life, we must have the power to see to it that the, that the abundance that's available is shared equitably. They may have beauty for the Second Rainbow Coalition. The legacy of the First Rainbow, the legacy of the First Rainbow Coalition dates back to its founding on April 4th, 1969, by the original Black Panther Party, original Young Lords, and Young Patriots Organization. A number of other organizations joined this coalition not too long afterwards, such as the American Indian Movement, Brown Berets. Rising Up Angry, the Red Guards, and others. Since the founding of the United States, the masses have developed a number of popular movements that came together to fight back against this capitalist imperialist ruling system in various ways or on particular demands. Nevertheless, none have established a movement quite like the First Rainbow Coalition. This historic movement was the first of its kind to establish a model of class struggle like no other. Its charismatic leader, Chairman Fred Hampton of the Illinois chapter of the original Black Panther Party, stated that at the end of the day, we weren't engaged in a quote-unquote race struggle. He said that the class struggle, goddammit, by uniting with the various uh, oppressed ethnicities and masses, they were able to bridge the gap between the various ethnic communities that white supremacy had long sought to keep divided. This class solidarity equipped them with the material basis and class consciousness to see their common class condition. Therefore, the necessity to form a united front against their common class oppressor, the capitalist and peerless ruling class. The ruling class viewed this as the greatest threat to their class rule, and subsequently used the entire oppressive forces of the state, police, courts, jails, prisons, intelligence agencies, etc., in order to crush this emerging revolutionary socialist movement. We refounded the Rainbow Coalition on May 14th, um, 2021, with the intent of upholding the, the legacy of the original Rainbow Coalition. We believe that this historic example is a model for the United Front that will best serve our class liberation. By, uniting with the very, by, by upholding the template and program of the, of the original Black Panther Party, which, which was subsequently adopted and later expanded by the original Young Lords, Young Patriots Organization, and all other original Rainbow Coalition members, we establish our pragmatic unity. The six disciplinary rules that we uphold ties all organizations in our coalition to a common professional discipline. History has bestowed upon our generation a common class mission to fulfill. The representatives of the Catholic and Peerless ruling class, represented by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party, cannot liberate us. It is their class intention and interest to uphold our common class oppression. Therefore, it is only we, the oppressed masses of all ethnicities and nationalities, who must build the necessary class solidarity, class consciousness, organizational structures, and a united front that will ultimately liberate ourselves. 
This is what the Second Rainbow Coalition is committed to. This is the historic mission we intend to fulfill. Dare to struggle, dare to win. All members of the coalition, New African Black Panther Party, White Panther Party, Green Party of New Jersey, Poor People's Army, La Mesa Nacional de Brand Braves, Nassau, North Alabama School for Organizers, New Era Young Lords, and American Indian Movement, Northeast Woodland Chapter. The six disciplinary rules. Number one, members will conduct themselves in a manner to bring credit to the coalition and will treat others with respect and politeness. Number one, number two, members will be sober when on Rainbow Coalition business and will not engage in any criminal activity while a member. Number three, no member will engage in violence except in the extremity of self-defense. Number four, members will be members will not gossip nor be divisive to the unity of the Second Rainbow Coalition. Number five, members will not act as informers or work against the purpose of the Second Rainbow Coalition. And number six, nobody is authorized to speak for the Second Rainbow Coalition is authorized to do so. And that is the statement of unity. All right. And I will bring up the and I'll bring up the uh, the book right now. What is it? Twenty seventh. Okay. All right, I hope I, I'm going to start screen sharing this right now. Can everyone see this? Yep. Right on. So does anyone want, want to read first or do y'all want me to start first? I can start. Right on. All right. <clears throat> to liberation schools. In the evenings, the young lawyers ran a liberation school. The experience and skill sets of, of key members facilitated its development. Denise Oliver, for example, had a full time instructor, uh, had been a full time instructor at the University of the, of the Streets, an anti poverty project for high school dropouts. And Idris Morales and Juan Gonzalez have previously developed an internal 13-week political education curriculum for the group's membership. Set on the large and more dynamic stage of the occupation, the school challenged the group to diversify the content and format of its political message. Puerto Rican and Black American history anchored the curriculum. And their quest to debunk uh, Eurocentricism the young lords highlighted the significance of people of color the world over as agents of change, emphasizing the struggle against U.S. imperialism in Puerto Rico and the history of the Black uh, resistance. They responded to the failure of public school curricula to make sense of the social economic troubles of East Harlem by uh, instructing on current events. They also examined negative media representations of Puerto Rican and Black uh, Puerto Ricans and Black Americans as criminals and welfare dependents. Screenings and discussions of such films as uh, Gilio Punta Vorcos, The Battle of Algiers, also formed part of the evening education routine. <clears throat> Pastor Carrazana saw the school as a personal affront. New York's Methodist church leaders deemed this communist inflicted, <clears throat> uh, uh, inflected uh, instruction irreconcilable with Christianity and one of the clearest expressions of the occupation's violation of the constitutionally protected right to religious freedom. Reverend Robert uh, Chapman denounced this narrow legal interpretation of the conflict as self-interested, self-interested, and one that the church officials did not believe themselves. Criticizing is underlying an assumption that, quote, the church and politics exist on separate planets, unquote. He underscored the conditions that brought the school into being. The systematic erasure and public education of the history and culture of non 
white American ethnic and racial groups, unquote. The Reverend drew out the human consequences. He wrote, quote, its practice is psychological genocide and that its implications to such groups are A, you really do not exist, or if you exist, B, you have no worth at all, and C, the only value you can have as a person is to attain when you absorb what, what we are and become like us. Even if uh, even if it had an honest intention to do so, however, the offer would be profane. Since a man's worth is in what he essentially is in and of himself, not in and of someone else, unquote. Reverend Chapman observed further that while the conditions that fuel the young Lord's actions might have been beyond the exp uh, experimental comprehension of the Cuban pastor, the church had abdicated its higher responsibilities. <laughs> its posture, in fact, contributed to the, quote, continuation of the crushing of humanity, unquote. By contrast, the Liberation School offered an antidote to such dehumanization through explicit analysis of poverty and racism and recovery of the histories, cultures, and struggles of the dispossessed. The Reverend thus defended the young Lord's right, quote, to teach their reasons why Puerto Rico should remain free from the United States statehood and what America is functionally rather than rhetorically to Puerto Ricans and to other non-white peoples at home and abroad, unquote. To those confronting oppression the world over the transmission <laughs> and production of knowledge had become an integral that had become integral to the contest for power and dignity as strategies of resistance and war. The school proved to be one of the most contra uh, controversial initiatives, arguably for rendering analysis of history at odds with mechanical interpretations and dominant ideology for flouting academic conventions regulating the instruction and production of knowledge. It also unleashed a public debate beyond the question of where children should go to school or who should control school curriculum and staffing higher. That's what's up. The term liberation itself raised uncomfortable uh, questions about the American creed. The real danger Reverend Chapman warned lay in the consequences of not finding systematic solution to these problems. The failure to grant oppressed groups, quote, self-respect, self-definition and dignity, unquote will lead America to, uh, quote, in, uh, to enact, quote, more repressive measures against them and to consider the final solution to her racial problem, unquote. With the advent of hyper-incarceration of these communities, the reverend's predictions were not off the mark. Uh, staging a Norican identity. Norican. Norican identity. At 6 p.m. each evening, the young Lord served dinner prepared by the local Puerto Rican women, including some of their mothers who brought pots of food or cooked meals. After 7.30, young Lord's discipline surrendered to creative uh, uh, revelry. Audible from a block away, the captivating sound of Congo drums uh, beckoned visitors to the church after work. Inside the infectious rhythm of Bamba uh, e Plena, the mu uh, battle music of the occupation arose, aroused spontaneous, uh, spontaneous eruptions of song and dance. Derived from the experience of African slaves and their descendants, Puerto Rican elites stigmatized the pop uh, these popular music genres for their historic association with Black people, uh, quote unquote, lax morals and biting political commentary. Older Puerto Ricans recall that this public embrace of their folk music by the younger generation triggered complex feelings, longing for the old country and vindication of their lives in New York. And for the children of the Puerto Rican migration who were, uh, grew up in the mainland for whom institutionalized racism in the streets and schools distorted their self-perception these sounds often tapped into the yearning for self-definition awakened by the Black Power movement. 
for the young lords, it was grounding music for their distinctive uh, bim, uh, bimbe and all in, all out celebration of Puerto Rican uh, folk tradition and emerging urban art forms at the church. The young lords launched their cultural experiment and protests against racist representations of people of color in museums and in the exclu exclusion of Black American and Puerto Rican artists from the New York uh, elite art war world. That January, Black American artists were swept into protesting the Metropolitan Museum's high-profile exhibition, Harlem On My Mind, a vieweristic rendering of Black life that excluded works by Black artists and whose catalog featured an incendiary term paper written by a Black high school student two years earlier. By year's end, the Young Lords were curating vanguard elements of Puerto Rican culture expression at the People's Church. The uh, inadvertent evolution of the church into an unorthodox art space responded to the era's demand for civil rights in the arts. It did so with a dynamic model of resistance, art making, and culture engagement that argued uh, argued a new direction in the movement to democratize the arts in New York. Committed to demystifying and democratizing art, the Young Lords also welcomed impromptu performances and fostered a fluid environment that blurred the line between art, artists and audience. Chairman Felipe, Felipe Luciano had long nurtured an interest in the arts. Respected for his broad and eclectic culture and knowledge, he was one of the original members of the last poets, the group of uh, spoken word artists and musicians whose creative work prefigured the emergence of hip hop. The young lords approached these evenings with sensitivity, helping to foster the works of a new generation of Puerto Rican poets, musicians, artists, and writers. The lineups often spark impromptu collaboration across genres. Traditional Puerto Rican drummers seated in the audience often jumped into the fray with impromptu drumming cadences, adding unexpected dimensions to the heft of a emerging urban poetry. Spoken word poetry captured the essence of things with the economy of words, illuminated social relations and aroused passions. Politicized by the world around them, artists had begun to rearrange reality with the symbols and music of Puerto, R Puerto Rico's resilient Afro-Indigenous heritage. Their renderings of joy and tragedy in Puerto Rico life captured an aesthetic uh, decades in the making rock of the crucible of Puerto Rican migration into New York. These high energy open mic gems captured the structure of feeling of the children of that migration who were swept into political activism by the civil rights Black power, women's and gay liberation movements, the Vietnam War and the social fallout of their parents' dislocation from Puerto Rico to the U.S. slums. It was here that playwright uh, and poet Pedro uh, Pedro Petri uh, gave the first public readings of Puerto Rican uh, obituary. The poem that according to the New York Times, ignited a movement, unquote. The poem is an epic epilogue to Puerto Rican workers and a weathering critique of the class that tracks the illusionary pursuit of the American dream. It snapshots their everyday working class Puerto Rican life dramatized the soul slain consequences of obedience to authority. <clears throat> and I think this is the poem. They work. They were never late. They never spoke back. They never went on strike without permission. They worked 10 days a week and were only paid for five. Juan, Miguel, Milagros, uh, Oga, uh, uh, Manuel, all died yesterday, today, and will die tomorrow, passing their bill collectors. On to the next of 10, all died, dreaming about America, hating the grocery stores. That sold them make believe steak, the bulletproof rice and beans, all dying, waiting, dreaming, and hating dead Puerto Ricans who never knew they were Puerto Rican. Uh, I think we could, they kicked. Uh, 
couple people out. <laughs> uh, but I keep on going. Let me meet. Okay, meet Gabby real quick. Hello, everyone. I don't know what fucking happened. My shit dropped. <laughs> I'm so sorry about that, Comrade Kwame. I'm so sorry about that. Okay, I'm making you co-host right now so you can let gotcha. people in. I don't know how long you've been off. I just looked up and saw uh, the screen shifting on me. <laughs> yeah, sorry. I was just, the screen The screen was, what, what, what was freezing on me. I'm like, what the fuck is happening? I was, um, did you stop at Puerto Rican obituary? Uh, we're, we're on the, uh, here, look, here, look, I'll, I'll, we're on the palm. Gotcha. I'll screen share again. I don't know what happened, man. I really don't. I'm sorry about that. Here you go. You all right. Can everyone see this? Yep. Yes. I, yep. They work. They, okay. Keep on scrolling. Okay. Here? Scroll next page. Okay. All right, so we 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 we'll leave we'll start back off right there. Oh here. Uh, go back, go back. Juan, Miguel. All right. All right, we'll start right there. All right. Juan, Miguel, Milagros, Olga, Manuel, all died yesterday, today. And will die tomorrow, passing their bill collectors on to the next of kin. All died dreaming about America, hating the grocery store that sold them make believe steak and bulletproof rice and beans. All died waiting, dreaming, and hating dead Puerto Ricans who never knew they were Puerto Ricans and will die again tomorrow, dreaming about Queens, clean cut, lily white neighborhood. They all died like a hero sandwich dies in the gourmet district at 12 o'clock in the afternoon. In name of the, his subjects, Petrie dignified the city's most demeaned workers in reclaiming their humanity. The ritual, ritual repetition of names in the text compels recognition on different terms. His de de depiction of Puerto Rican migration as a kind of collective death, a universal theme, opened new ways of seeing Puerto Ricans among New Yorkers and others around the world who uh, assess the poem through his several translations, uh, yeah, access, who had access the poem through his several translations in Spanish, Italian, and German, uh, German, among other languages. Puerto Rican obituary also unmasked with levity the unconscious handiwork of dominant ideology and its influence on individual and group behavior and perceptions of reality. Pre street, uh, P P Petrie's vi uh, vision end ends with an ode to the uh, humanistic aspiration of Afro Puerto Rican resilience. Aki que pasa powder is what's happening. Aki, aki to be called negrito y negrita means to be called love. Uh, somebody want to take over from there? Uh, I'll take over if that's okay with everyone. All right. Uh, can everyone hear me, by the way? All power, I can hear you. Right on. All right. The outpouring of performances of works like Puerto Rican obituary on, on makeshift stages across the country produced yet deeper changes. They destabilized traditional conceptions of cultural production and one of its major assumptions that people of color produce lower forms of art. And among poor people of color who might have not seen themselves as artists, performances, per, um, performances like these embolden their creative urges, especially in the context of the young Lord's revolutionary politics. As best, the People's Church prefigured the many possibilities of, uh, for the art in a new society. That radical redistribution of time and resources could unleash the, the creative capacity of all. <laughs> yep. This, exp this expansive vi um, vision of art making, however, sh however sh short lived, also broadened the narrow framework of civil rights in the arts and helped re redefine the goals of the pre of a pre existing cohort of activist artists 
towards independent art space and an institution building. The Young Lords um, cat um, catalyzed, yeah, catalyzed the work of artists who grasp the, the significance of art both as expression of humanity and potential vehicle of resistance. Together, they understood. They, they, together, they understood that the politics of, of cultural production, of who has access to and who doesn't, of representations of of subjected people in art, and the absence of some artists and not others in the art world, is bound up with, with the struggle for human li liberation. The Young Lord's mixture of militancy, good works political education, and cultural resistance had an, had an observable impact on diverse sectors of the city. On mainstream... Sorry about that. There we go. On mainstream... Um, one mainstream report, ob report observed that, that the occupation, quote, reached like a wave to the margins of society, even affecting some of the street gangs in Harlem, as in Chicago, unquote. As the local point... As the as for the focal point of public debate on the Puerto Rico on the Puerto Rican question, the occupation um um resuxiated resuxiated the Puerto Rican pro independence movement in New York. Its leaders now appreciate the possibility of growth among the children of Puerto Rican migrants, many who did not agree with the full extent of the Young Lord's Third World. Socialist revolutionary orientation supported them nonetheless. At least at least sixty three cross that um, denominational um, ecum ecumenical. I don't know how to pronounce that. Leaders re representing representing quotes quote unquote national church agencies endorsed their projects in a public letter addressed to Doctor Weasley. Osborne, the district's um, superintendent of the FSUMC, the letter also demanded a response to the quote, the social the social crisis by means other than alliance with the state through the through through courts and police action. Unquote. Another 20 Puerto Rican leaders and anti-poverty and community organizations backed the group's action in a public statement. The Young Lords enjoyed the strong support um, among new left activists, member, new, new left activists. Members of the branches of the Black Panther Party were among were were among the approximately 150 activists who permanently wrote, rotated in and out of the church. Student Nonviolent um, Coordinating Committee member H. Rap Brown visited and spoke at a church, as did National Black Panther Party leader um, Kathleen Cleaver. Ready, read by West Coast Attorney Charles Gary Huey P. New by Charles Gary Huey P. Newton Sol Solidarity gr gre Greeting quote thrilled the the packed chapel with with clenched fists raised and spread arm salute unquote. Right, fucking on. Acting, acting independently of the Young Lord, students from Col Columbia University and Union Theolog Theological um, Seminary stage a twenty-four hour sit-in at Osborne's official demand and in Osborne's office, demanding that the Puerto Rican radicals be granted space there. A long list of celebrities made made appearances, among them film director Elia Kazin. Screen, screenwriter Bud um, Bud Schulberg, boxer Jose Torres, actor Jane Fonda, writer um, G Gloria um, Steinem, and rising salsa stars Jo Jo Cuba, Jo Batan, and Ray um, Ray Barreto. And while the Puerto Rican theater actor Rita More Moreno did not make an appearance, she sent funds. The occupation transformation transformed the, or the, organi the organizational character of the Young Lords. The group experienced significant um, membership growth, especially among women. In the same time, female members were drawn into the center of church operations. Their deeper engagement with politics as public speakers and development as leaders raised questions about the place of human 
of women in movements for social change. Many in the community, including leading members of the organization, believe that revolutionary behavior was tolerable in a young man, in a young man, but not in a young woman. Many parents of young or many parents of YLO members did not support their children's actions at the church. A disproportionate number of these parents had daughters in the organizations who were taken out of the church, quote, by their ears, unquote. As discussed in the following chapters, the growth of, of women's membership and leadership during the occupation accelerated a major political rift. For others, like the handsome and charismatic um, um, Richie Perez, the church was a court... What, the, the church was the place where they found meeting and purpose beyond personal relationships. According to Ricci, the night he came to the church, he had been out dancing. His political work had been, has, had been stemmed, stemmed up to, to the, mo up to the moment by a series of unfulfilling, um, amorous relationships that night, he found his political home and with it, more stability in his personal life. Gloria Rodriguez's um, tear-filled account captures what, um, captures what many Puerto Rican youth thought at the church. I walked in and I felt like I was home. It was very gripping. It felt like that was where I really wanted to be and where I belonged. The concerns that all these people had about equal rights and making a difference in the world and standing up for what they believe in and being really committed, that moved me. It moved everything I felt I, I, I was about at the time, unquote. Some other participants fell in love, discussing the broader significance of his story and of love during the church occupation. Um, Rovira explains, quote, when you go into the world of the unknown and there is a risk of, comp of, of component, you grow attached to people, you build bonds. And that worked to our favor because it did not allow the police state to intimidate us at all. The bonds we built is what gave us strength. And for a group whose oldest members was 25 years old, for that chemistry to happen to people of that age group is a big positive because there's nothing that the enemy could have done to intimidate us, unquote. Right fucking on, the youth of the future. Bunkered in, in, in amid popular support and positive media reviews, the young lords would not be intimidated by the threat of a police break-in or legal action. Although Reverend Karan, um, Karazana had allowed the police to, to, to lead negotiations at the start of the conflict, now they were held at bay. On various occasions, the NYPD, quote, sent their officers to the door, telling us in detail what would happen to us legally if we continued the occupation, that you can do 10 years in prison if you don't come out. They tried it all and didn't work, unquote. In legal limbo, on Tuesday, December 30th, the church obtained a, a court order requiring the young Lord's attorney to appear before the New York Supreme Court the next day to, quote, show cause why they should not be ousted from the church, unquote. The order was, was served late in the afternoon, allowing their attorneys to postpone the hearing, argue, arguing that, quote, it, arguing that it, quote, was received too late to um, adequ adequately prepare for the case, unquote. With, with the New Year holiday upon, um, upon them, the young lords could continue their political um, revelry at the church. Their attorneys um, argued that they were upholding one of the major tenets of the Methodist Church, service, service to the community, which the, FS, which the FSUMC had renounced in East Harlem. Reinforcing this position, a young lord flyer distributed that day stated, quote, The first responsibility of the church is to the people. The church is supposed to serve the people and work with them. This is what it means to be a Christian, unquote. Yep. On Friday, January 2nd, the hearing's president, um, pre um, preceding judge, Hyman Korn, concluded that the church occupation, quote, even for what participants consider um, laudable, laudable purposes, te um, tends, tends to a breach of the peace and, and impinges on the, on the sanctity of of this holy place, unquote. <laughs> Fucking bullshit. He granted the church a, 
a, a, a preliminary injunction ordering the young lords to end the occupation. Served to the young lords at approximately 5.30 p.m., it was read out aloud on the church steps by Sheriff Robert E. Lee. Wow. His confederate namesake struck the young lords and their supporters as downright comical. Fucking hell. Taking advantage of their weekend reprieve, the young lords held together new conference on Saturday, January 3rd. The New York Times um, quoted Juan Gonzalez, quote, We are all pr presently in contempt of court. All of us, including you, in in including you, pr um, pr press man, unquote. Gonzalez asked, quote, why then have we not ha why then have we not been arrested? Unquote. He answered, quote, because the power of the Puerto Rican community outside of the church and the three hundred people that occupied the church last night are preventing the city from moving against us. Um, unquote. According to the New York Post, Gonzalez also announced that the young lords had no intention of leaving the church until their demands were met, and that quote, no injunction and no police clubs will, will stop us, unquote. The young lords were in contempt of court, but the church um, would not would have to seek a contempt a contempt citation against the young lords for non-compliance, quote unquote, before police could go in. On Sunday, January fourth, the young lords opened the church for for regular Sunday service. A small a small number of congregants attended, most of whom were among the church's youngest members. Board members argued that the young lords claimed they that they allowed the congregation quote to worship at the at the sufferance of a takeover group, a sinister behavior unquote. But the church's youth group um thought differently. On the day, the two young women who led the youth group, Nancy Vasquez and Car and Carmen Pietri, um um presided at the at at the the Lidurgi, Lidurgi, with the participation of Joe, Frank, and Pedro Pietri. Carmen remembers that that day will, well because she was ill, and before the services began, began Juan Gonzalez led her to one of the church's health stations where, where on-call doctors treated her. In attendance were Puerto Rican community leaders and representatives of anti-poverty organizations who had written a public letter in support of the young lords. Because removal of the young lords seemed imminent, these supporters sought to bring moral and political influence to bear for a peaceful resolution. Their statement was read by Lindsay Aide Arnie um, Segada, um, who, whose firing had not yet been made public. The opening of the church for services that Sunday would prove at um, advantageous in court. The church's attorney, Oscar Gonzalez um, um, Suarez, argued in, in, the, in the injunction request that the young lord's actions violated the, the constitutional pro protected rights to worship. This theme was developed in a statement released by Reverend Caranzana and, and the district leader leaders of the Methodist Church in New York, District um, Superintendent Weasley Osborne and Bishop Lloyd um, Wick. For these leaders, at issues was, quote, whether this, so whether this local congregation of Christians shall have the right to determine their own ministry and the programs to be operated in their own church, unquote. The injunction request cha changed that, quote, the defendants have threatened the peace and tranquility of the congregation and the and the community, unquote, and deprive the, con the congregation of, quote, its civil rights and the constitutional right to peacefully assemble and worship God according to their, their to their conscience, unquote. On Monday, January 5th, the church's attorney, in, con in, in consultation with New York um, County Sheriff D. D. Lancey, obtained a court contempt order requiring representatives of the organization to appear in court the following morning. And an affidavit, cha an affidavit challenging the church's application for a preliminary injunction. The young lords and their attorneys debunked charges that the group had, um, had for months quote interrupted the religious services at a church. Had they been disruptive and unwelcome, the church would not have invited them and their supporters to a quote coffee clutch with the pastor of the congregation and a few um, um, par parishioners. Unquote. The the deposition argued 
argued further that the young lords had been scapegoated by the church's lead um, lead minister and members of the broad of the board because quote the young lords represent a serious threat to their conscience and challenge to the church to observe the Methodist Church fundamental principle that quote service to the people of the community is an important religious function not to be ignored unquote the um, they quoted from the Methodist um, social creed found in the book of discipline of the United of the United Methodist Church quote we believe the inner city to be a mission to, to be a mission field crying out for bold new creative ways of witness here is a here is emerging a pagan generation committed to values that run counter to those of Christ. Therefore, we call our urban con congregations to a deeper involvement in the neighborhood life, unquote. The Young Lord's attorneys also challenged charges of the private property violation. Also citing the Book of Discipline, they suggested that for its failure to use private property in accordance with, with church doctrine, the church, not the Young Lord's, should be held accountable for such a violation. Quote, we believe God is the owner of all things and that the individual holding of property is lawful and a sacred trust under God. Private property is to be used for the, for the ma manifestation of Christian love and liberty and, and to support the church's mission in, in the world. All forms of property, whether private, corporate, or public, are to be held in solemn trust and used responsibly for human good under the sovereignty of God. That's what they claim, but not what they actually do, because they're fucking co-opted Christianity to serve their own purposes. <laughs> on on Tuesday, January sixth, um, with while legal um procedures um wound wound their way through the courts, the young lords tied in church security and celebrated three three Kings Day, a major gift giving a giving event for children among Puerto Ricans. As Pablo Guzman explained in, in the media, quote. This is a very important holiday in Puerto Rico, and we are going to party. If the police come, we'll just continue partying. We're going to have folk dances and songs and experience our culture because that's what the lords are, are all about. Unquote. The coincidence of Three Kings Day with the end of their legal proceedings was a sign of things to come. On on that same on that same day, a coalition of students from Union Theological Seminar in Columbia University met with Methodist Bishop Lloyd Wick. To demand to demand that the church drop the, the charges quote, against the 13 YLO members arrested in December 1969 unquote and that the church quote furnished space for the young lords for their programs unquote knowing that that their arrest was imminent the, the lords reported that the press that while we may not open the doors quote unquote to the police they will not resist arrest. With public support from over 20 Puerto Rican leaders and anti-poverty and community organizations, the young girls were about to leave the church on their own terms. Their attorneys in the sheriff's office arranged exactly what would happen. At 5.30 a.m. on January 7, 1970, while a, while a dusting of snow covered the ground, hundreds of riot gear clad police officers assumed positions on, ro on rooftops and the area surrounding the church, which was close to traffic. Inside, the young lords stood their ground. The presence of approximately 12 children and six attorneys who spent the night at a church was, expect, was expected to safeguard against police vi violence. Led by Under Sheriff T. William Kell, at around 7 a.m., eight unarmed deputies tried to open the, the barricade front doors. Two of the young lords' attorneys accompanied the, the deputies every step of the way. Once inside, Kell informed the young lords that they were under arrest. At approximately 7.15 a.m., 150 young lords and supporters walked out of the church, 20 at a time, and into police vans. Some of the militants ex exited the church singing the Puerto Rican national song, Que bonita, um, que, que bonita um, ban bandera. What a beautiful flag. Que bonita bandera. Others shouted, power to the people, on their way out. Still, still, others walked down at church steps in solemn silence with raised fists. Right fucking on. And that's the fucking fascist, worthless pigs fucking doing this shit. They were transported to the courtroom of Justice Saul S. Street in New York's Supreme Court building in downtown Manhattan. In, in court, the young lords performed an act of many of 
an act that many of them would not have dared to enact as children. The New York Times reported that, quote, as their names and addresses were called off, the young lords rose, many of them cor correcting the reader by giving the, the Spanish pronunciation of their names, unquote, <laughs> right fucking on. Although the young lords had picked a fight with a conservative church over space for a breakfast program, the occupation was also about their determination to preserve their dignity and, uh, and of their migrant parents in the face of racism and language discrimination. The mangling of their names in school earlier in their lives and the feeling that they were treated like garbage by the police and hospitals and by the administrative structure of the city was core to their organization's reasons for being. And now, as they stood before Justice Street, they were intent on staging um, dissent and setting their names and identities straight to the, to the court record. The Young Lord's attorneys, Richard Richard Ash and Daniel um, Myers, explained that amid their round-the-clock negotiations with police, which which ensured the peaceful arrest that morning, they had not they had not they not had time to consult with with the activists. The judge released all 150 defendants on their own um, recognizance and set their hearing for January 26, 1970. For the young lords, the church became a staging ground for what a new society could look like and, and accomplish. They saw the services organized co collaboratively for human need rather than, rather, than, rather than competitively for profit as a living example of the possibilities of a social society. Thousands took part in some way in the activities conducted at the church. Participants and, re and reporters alike described the intoxicating atmosphere created by the young lords with language echoing V. V. I. Lennon's descriptions of revolution as, quote, festivals of the oppressed, during which ordinary people, quote, come forward to a so come forward to a activity to so a actively as creators of a new of a new social order, unquote. The United States in the late 1960s was in the midst of a of an all side upheaval of, of ideas, in the way uh, in the way in the way the nation understood itself in the place of racialized groups, women and gay and gay people and lesbians within it, and 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 the halting but increasing recognition of the root causes of social problems. Throughout the decade, initiatives like the Young Lords Church Offensive pressed a debate about the nation's social priorities and, and the contradictions of American democracy. At the heart of this public struggle were the children of Puerto Rican migrants, whose work helped, the, whose work helped to cement a place for Puerto Ricans in public discourse and New York um, City po politics. As the dramatic site were as the dramatic site where the most political elements of Puerto Rican culture were 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 created for eleven days, the People's Church marked the first public staging of a New New Rican identity and the and the idea of a radical Puerto Rican art space. Such a project would later be institutionalized in places like the new in places like the New Rican village, a cultural arts center, quote unquote, on the Lower East Side and showcased the first Nurican the, um, theatrical productions and was, quote, home to Afro-Caribbean music's event, um, uh, event guard. Um, does anyone else want to read? If no, that's okay. I can finish it out. Right on. Um, um, what page do we stop at again, comrade? Uh, this is the last page. Right on. All right. The Nurikan Poets uh, Cafe grew from a gathering in the East Village apartment of Puerto Rican writer Miguel Algarve uh, uh, to a vibrant New York City institution for the performing arts, El Museo de Barrio, will become a major museum on Fifth Avenue dedicated to Latinx cultures. The church occupation also presaged the emergence of La Casa Casitas Corrillas del Bronx, the cultural project that transformed abandoned Bronx homes into vibrant sites that evoke Puerto Rican countryside aesthetics, music, and culture. The week after the arrest, several hundred 
uh, Young Lords again attended Sunday Mass at FSUMC, requesting permission to run a breakfast program. Carranza, uh, Carranza did not concede an inch. Shortly uh, thereafter, 84 Protestant domina- uh, denomination leaders pressured the FSUMC to seek resolution with the Young Lords outside of the courts. To that end, the parties were brought together by the newly formed Board of Mediation for Community Disputes, a Lindsay initiative that brought collective bargaining strategy and labor to dis- in, to disputes in community. With Herman Badilio, a mediator, a series of long, heated meetings ensued. In late February, the church dropped charges against the young lawyers and agreed to a initiative, uh, initiate a daycare center and a clinic for drug rehab program, a rehabilitation program to which the city agreed to contribute $200,000. The church never followed through. When the young lords ended their church uh, offensive, their spirits were high. The occupation had electrified the neighborhood, inspired artists and progressive of all, all races across the city and drawn the media into the orbit of the young lords with journalists around the country and the world reporting on their activities. On the same night that the young lords abandoned the church, Republican Governor Governor Nelson Rockefeller proposed during his State of the State address to launch a breakfast program for 35,000 poor children in the city. (laughs) In response, Harlem's Democratic State Senator uh, Basile Patterson told the media, quote, I think the Black Panthers and Young Lords have influenced the governor, unquote, whom he condemned for not having any original proposals of his own. Even the judge who forced the church evacuation after declaring the Young Lords in contempt of a court order seemed to equivocate in his condemnation of the Puerto Rican radicals. Reporting for the uh, for Pacifica, uh, Pacifica Radio, journalist Jeff Common uh, explained the judge was impressed by what the young lords had done for the people, so he released them on their own recognizance without bail. The attention the young lords garnered from different sectors of the of society, especially from the media, strengthened the organization's sense of itself and convinced its leaders that they could challenge the structure of power and win. And that is the conclusion of that chapter. And that's it. Wow, that was fucking awesome, man. That was fucking awesome. I fucking love this chapter so much. And, you know, this right here, this is community work. You know, this right here is actual um, building class consciousness and building solidarity and showing people what a society can actually look like if we actually work together, you know. And this right here, because I don't know if y'all remember, but earlier in the chapters, they, um, in order to dehumanize and dehumanize Puerto Ricans, they, um, an excuse was made that the reason why Puerto Rican communities were, um, were impoverished and had high crime rates was because of a quote unquote cultural laziness, <laughs> quote unquote. Yeah, um, yeah, as we saw here, the, the Puerto Ricans use culture in order to radicalize, um, in order to radicalize, agitate, and um, and increase the class consciousness of the of the masses and, and challenge those racist, white supremacist notions to combat um, racial oppression. So I fucking lo- lo- love this right here. Yeah, I thought I thought. Uh... That was definitely uh, right on right there uh, because at the end of the day, it, it just go to show, like we were saying in a, uh, uh, a Friday, when when, mm-hmm. the peop- when the people take actions and challenge their social conditions and challenge some of these social institutions, it draws right. the people in and force them to raise their collective conscience where now people ask them like, yeah, well, it seems like what these young lords is talking about is what the church supposed to be about in the first place. So why y'all ain't been doing this? Why y'all have a yep. problem with them feeding and kids? Why y'all have a problem with them uh, establishing uh, free health care? Why you have a problem with them establishing, uh, you know, liberation schools and using the church for the community? Ain't that what the church supposed to be about in the first place? 
So it, yep. it, it, it's a part of that class struggle. You know what I'm saying? That they were waging at that time that it's on a local community level, but it's actually forcing the exposed contradictions in the system and how these yep. social institutions, either they're going to work for colonial, uh, uh, maintaining colonial subjugation of us, or it's going to allow us to liberate our uh, communities right. and actually uh, make these institutions work for the people. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. I think that's the essence of what this shows right here is that, you know, this was a big win for the young lords. It gave them a big platform to talk to the whole world. You know what I mean? And uh, yep. at the end of the day, it really, like you said, raised the consciousness of that community. Right on. You know? You're going to say something, Shanti? Uh, yeah. I was going to say that, you know, I find it very funny that they talk about the reason why, you know, Puerto Ricans and why Boricuas have you know, why their communities are such and such disraced because of cultural laziness. It's so funny when they say that, um, did they forget that Puerto Ricans are a mix of Taino, indigenous African, Basque, Spaniard, Irish, mm -hmm. French, Berber, other groups? Did they forget about that? Did they purposely forget about that? Or just because they came from the island that they're culturally lazy? It's the yep. same story that their dino ancestors have faced since Columbus came to their island. Yep. Their island. And they want to talk about cultural laziness? Really? They have bomba. They salsa. I mean, come on. Really? I really? find it funny. I find it funny how they say that um, that Puerto Ricans, that um, that new African that new African people, that indigenous people, and that and that colonized people are quote unquote lazy. When when it was colonized people who built this fucking country out of slavery, this country was really <laughs> built on the backs of fucking slaves. New York was really built by indigenous enslaved um by enslaved indigenous people. Like exactly, that was my people. We made New York. Yep. We made the we made the White House. We made those buildings. We yep. did. So the fact that they want to talk about laziness when they destroyed our civilizations. They destroyed our infrastructures. They took our resources. They kidnapped us. They tried to kill every single one of us, enslaved us, million in the millions. And like we, I mean, we made the U.S. off the backs of our own oppression, off of being kidnapped. We were not slaves. We were kidnapped. We were subjugated by Europe. That's what happened. And the fact that um, the young lords, that young people were able to bring that to the, um, the more um, public forefront is, I mean, I mean that's unheard of. I mean, a group of young dino you know, being able to raise that kind of consciousness the way that they did um, with uh, the church, know being you know using the church sort of like as a weapon as a weapon mm -hmm. for religion, you know for you know their breakfast program and all that stuff you know that is very very important for them to put their foot down to keep their feet down on um you know people that want to continue um colonialist oppression racialized oppression class um class apocalypse and stuff, you know, the fact that they were able to still keep their feet down on the people, I mean, that was unheard of. And I think that's really important for us young people today to really understand is that we use these places as um, beating ground for uh, a new fight uh, for revolution, for liberation, for a new world. You know, you know, the, you know we cannot rely on you know, the older generations to, you know, fight for us because, you know, they, you know, many of them have got used to it. So it's up to us to finally break that cycle. Um, right on. And to show up for our community by any ways necessary. And if that means um, retelling our history, retelling our destiny, um, reclaiming our destiny, reclaiming our roots, reclaiming our identity, reclaiming what has been stolen from us by non-Indigenous Europe, then we will do that. Right on, all power.
All power. I just want to say that um, I feel like colonizers like to decredit Chinese people because that's the bridge between African and indigenous people. Like that's like a, a huge, like uh, both mixed ancestral type of people. So I, they like to like lean this credit from both. They're not African and they're not indigenous. They just, they're just disappeared off. You know, they just forget about them. But I really like, I have um, a sister that's Taino and she's taught me a lot about their culture and it's pretty much indigenous and like African as far as like just cultural stuff and foods, everything. It's, I don't know. I, I, I understand what you're what you're saying, sister, how um, like that group of people is like forgotten about kind of, or it's really, they're necessary to, well, for me, I like to unite black and indigenous people together. That's like my whole, my whole thing is to bring them, but they're actually like the same, you know? Right on. As far as like the Chinese people, go like their cultures and their um like specifically i don't know if anyone knows specifically about taino people i know about taino people i've talked to you about i'm I'm talking about about taino people before comrade sally (laughs) yeah they have like a lot of um similarities like as far as indigenous people and i feel like that's like a huge gap between african people and indigenous people like taino people specifically I don't know if anyone knows what I'm talking. Right on. You were gonna say you were gonna say something, Comrade Kwame. Uh, I I was just gonna highlight how the irony of how they you like try to stereotype us and uh denigrate us for different things, like calling us lazy. Like, yeah. think about this. Uh, can, can they point out one lazy slave? Like if they if we were so lazy, then what what, what, was, they, what was they? If, if we was lazy, we was working from KC in the morning to KC at night. You know what I mean? Picking cotton yep. and all kind of stuff. It's just like the uh the slogan Indian giver. That never made sense to me. It was like, how the fuck they Indian That's- givers and you motherfuckers took their land and then we y'all give them uh uh land. Y'all take it back and say, oh, you know, we just found uh, minerals over here, so we're going to have to move y'all uh, to another location. Like, all of it is the opposite. It's exactly. like a projection. It's a projection of who the colonialized, uh, the colon, uh, the colonizers were. You know what I'm saying? Yep. Hey, it's it's their own uh, character traits and projecting that onto us. <laughs> you know what I mean? Exactly. Yep. You know, you know, and this is what, um, and this is what, um, and this, and this is what, and this, what this, this, and this, what, um, and that's, and and that's why, and that's what white supremacist fucks do all the time. They, they project the failings of capitalism, and um, they, um, they project the failings of capitalism on liberation movements and on socialism. You know, they, um, you know, they say, um, they say that communism is, is when there is when there's no food, when that's capitalism. They say that communism is when, is, is when you're stripped of your individuality and you, and you're not a person, but you're a cog in the machine. No, that's capitalism. Every single fucking, every single anti-socialist, anti-communist movement bullshit that they say is literally a projection of is really a projection of the failings of this capitalist, imperialist, white supremacist, ableist, patriarchal, queerphobic, queerphobic socioeconomic system. Exactly. Everything. Literally. Exactly. And and the fact and 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 and, and they say it earlier, I believe I believe the fucking Methodist Church fucking um tried to demonize um tried to demonize um, the young lords by calling their by calling their movement communist and and do that negative connotation with communism through through anti communist propaganda and white supremacist bullshit. They're trying to demonize their movement by by projecting the failings of capitalism onto communism it onto socialism. Um... Yep. So so but but that right there 
with with, with, with the Puerto Rico, um, with, with the with the young lords did. That right there, that is building a new society. That is that is radicalizing, educating, elevating, and um, and showing people how things can be better. How it doesn't have to fucking be this way. How everything is interconnected, and how we could have a new society with a new socio a new socioeconomic system, a new a new mode of production, a new culture, new social relations, a better way of fucking life. You know, um, and 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 how do we do that? We do that through cultural revolution, through mass line, and um, and through survival programs, building up. Um, Building up self sufficiency and radicalization within our communities, and once we build that connection within our communities, once um w- once the, the communities observe um observe th- these revolutionary activities and how and how it's making positive change, then they will respect and engage in those revolutionary activities. Then they will begin organizing. Then they will begin agitating. Then they will adopt the ideological and political line of the party. Then they will be elevated. And what, and what will they do? Then, then they'll do it within their own communities. They'll, they'll spread it. They'll, they'll continue to radicalize people. That's how we build right. um, our, our movement. And so, and so I kind of want, wanted to connect something that France Fanon said. He said that under colonialism, and under and, uh, and other cultural genocide, the culture of colonized people is forcibly made to um, to decay. It's 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 grinded to an absolute halt to cause it to die. It doesn't progress. It doesn't, it doesn't evolve. It doesn't it doesn't it doesn't go forward. It stops. But under cultural revolution, the culture continues. It evolves. It adapts. It keeps going. The great, and the, exactly. And, and that's what we have to do. That's what colonialism is. That's what the capitalist system is. White supremacy, white supremacy, and, and imperialism is the death of culture. Is the co-opting, is the co-opting and erasure of culture to to subjugate, oppress, and exploit the masses. Just everything within a capitalist society is is made to cater to is is made to cater to the is made to cater to the bourgeois. It's made to cater to whoever that whoever that society benefits. And that yep. is everything. That is the state, the gun, the institutions. Everything is made to cater to to that specific socioeconomic system and how it's structured, how um how it's developed and who and who it's made for. And everything within that society is used, co-opted and made to cater to the oppressor class. And this includes culture. How many times have um, how many times have 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 you seen th- these companies co-opt art, music, literature, and so on and so forth to express reactionary individualistic behavior? They do it all the fucking time. They fucking co-opt hip hop and rap to fucking encourage reactionary individualistic behavior to try mm-hmm. to try and divide the masses and, and to try and lead that culture to its fucking death. Oh, that's that's, what, a- that's what they try to do. That's what they do. And with hip hop, you know, they keep forgetting that it was the youth that made hip hop. Yep. It was young people that made hip hop. They would have nothing without the youth. They would have nothing without hip hop by us. And when it was commodified by these capitalists, by these pig entities, they revised history completely. Erased yep. um, Caribbean people, from the history of the making of hip hop and make it seem like it's some quote unquote foundational black American genre when it's not. It was a collective effort between new Africans and Caribbeans. Okay. Do, do not miss history here because nope. that is exactly what happened. It was a united effort in South in the South Bronx. That's what it was, but they have revised and distorted the real revolutionary political, um, plight that is hip-hop us being poor being homeless living by whatever means we could making a new culture a new history that has influenced us greatly but the fact that it was commodified the way that it was especially in the 80s 
you know, the fact, you know, the way it was commodified, it had it, it turned into a weapon of self-destruction in our communities. They they've managed to promote um, um, intercommunal violence and self-destruction within our communities. It was not about it was not about its revolutionary purpose anymore, you know, because they have made it into where they could use it as um, a weapon of class warfare against new African people, against Boricua people, against Irish people, et cetera. So the fact that, um, you know, because we are uh, some of the most culturally prostituted uh, peoples in uh, this colonialist society, we are. Mm -hmm. They took blues, they took jazz, they took rock and roll. Um, they have commodified our instruments, um, instruments of resistance. They have co-opted congas, they have uh, co-opted the djembe, they have co-opted timbales, the, con the bongos. We made Gospel. those. Yeah, and so, um, you know, the fact that they still want to call us, you know, lazy and with no culture, even though they took everything, every single thing that made us, us from us, you know, it, you know, it's just so, it's, it, it's, it's just so funny to me. And that is what we have to deal with. We need to bring back our own history because the way that they have made it out to be, um, especially, you know, with hip hop, once again, this so-called foundational black American, you know, American descendants of slavery genre when that is not what it was, even though rap did um, have its roots from us, from our indigenous African ancestors, hip hop, we're talking about hip hop. That was a collective effort between, mm -hmm. between colonized youth. So that's also another important thing of cultural revolution as well, to reclaim our history exactly. Collectivize. Exactly, exactly how it happened. Not in the perspective of the capitalist class, not in the perspective of the bougies, not in the perspective of rich billionaires. Influencers, quote unquote. <laughs> exactly. It's, his, it's, it's our destiny. It's the history through the people. That's what cultural revolution is. It's our destiny being told and being revitalized and being kept alive and being protected from being um, prostituted by pig capitalists, by pig, uh, by the pig bourgeoisie, by um, pig entities that, um, you know, you know, with so much freaking irony, you know, is you know, it's just unbelievable. So that's what cultural revolution is: it's our destiny being kept alive. I I put some uh some of the uh, poetry and speeches by Felipe Luciano in a, uh, in a group. I see it. Here. So if I anyone check those out. Uh, but yeah, you can, you can listen to some of uh, like uh, Felipe Luciano poetry and stuff. See like the influence of hip hop, uh, the origins of with, uh, and I like that they spoke about the last poets and uh, the spoken yeah. word artists and stuff like that because it was it was a lot of uh different uh influences that went into you know uh hip hop and uh how it all came about. You know what I'm saying? So definitely y'all check that out whenever y'all get a chance. He got a, he got one on there. Uh let me see what it's called again. It's like his one of his most famous ones. Cause it's making them uh making Puerto Ricans recognize their African roots. It's called he he borrow my pretty nigger. Oh uh, yeah, that one. Yeah, check that I've out. I've heard about it. Yep. Uh, it, it's all all of his uh poetry and stuff was uh, well a lot of it is in that link I just sent. Check that out. That's probably one of his most famous ones. Uh, and it's basically just like I said, just uh recognizing. Yep. Thing with Felipe Luciano, he he always recognizes African ancestry as a Puerto Rican. Uh, for a long time, Puerto Ricans struggle with that. You know what I mean? Uh, exactly. That's my thing. Cha Cha and the Young Lords brought out. They was like, "Nah, we a mix of people." <laughs> you know what I'm saying? At yep. one point, 
mixed with is African. You know what I'm saying? I respect the fact that uh Supi Toro <laughs> is keeping that legacy going on where they recognize their indigenous roots, their African roots, you know what I mean? And uh, you know, expressing that in a way where it's healthy, it's not causing cognitive dissonance in, in, in Puerto Rican. Right on. I've said before, and I will, 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 um, will say it again, the cultures of, of the Caribbean, human culture, Puerto Rican culture, Jamaican culture, and so on and so forth, have their roots in African and indigenous cultures. It's an amalgam. It, um, um, they have their roots um, in, in indigenous and in, in indigenous and African and African culture is a mixture of those cultures of 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 colonized people being oppressed and struggling and surviving against yeah. cultural erasure and cultural extinction. Um, Puerto Rican um, um, Puerto Rican um, culture has its, has has its roots in Tahino culture. In Yoruba culture and so on and so forth, you know. So you know? right on. So, so yeah, you know the way. Um, and and that's what um and that's and, and that's what these fucking bourgeois fucks are trying to do. They're trying to demonize and dehumanize, colonize people to um to um to not trust one another, to um to um to to disconnect um Puerto Ricans from their African. Roots and to and, and to see and to see new African people as their enemy instead of the oppressor class, you know. White. Yep. To to, to um to whitewash them. Exactly, because if you look at the demographics of um, Boricuas here within these borders, and that's what they are borders, um, you can see that the demographics are completely wrong. Yep. They say that most Puerto Ricans are so-called white when that's not even the case. Yep, Go in literally. Puerto Rican neighborhood and tell me, do you see a full-blown Spaniard face? No, you don't. Nope. No, you don't. You see African, you see Taino, you see Basque, you see Irish, you see French, you know, you see Berber. That's what you see. They are a mix of those peoples. They are not some biological um, marker that has been placed on them, you know. Within that, again, once again, yep. this, this is racializing um, people of indigenous ancestry and indigenous African ancestry into being this, you know, quote unquote brown, quote unquote right race, racial people. But that is not it. That really? is not, and the fact that. Um, you know, I mean, I mean, I mean. Once again, go to a Puerto Rican neighborhood. You can see for yourself that's not the case. Yep. Um. And um. And I wanted to bring up what Sally May says as well. You know how um how Tahino culture um 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 melded with um with oppressed enslaved African people that were stolen. For, um, for, um, from West Af from West Africa and how and how and how and how a new culture brought about um, from um, from that and, and Sally May I believe you were you were talking a bit about it. Do you want to expand on that point, Tom Sally there? Yes, I'm here. Sorry. Um, I just uh, really believe that Taino culture. I don't know if anyone knows specifically about it. Does anyone know? Um, I know. Um. I know, um, I know a bit about Tahino culture and the Tahino people. How they were, how they were the the primary indigenous ethnic group of um of of the Caribbean. How well, they, how they, a have... lot of um indigenous people don't like to say they're indigenous from from my like talking to other indigenous people, but they actually mm -hmm. really are indigenous. And I like, yeah. I have a friend who's Tahino, and she's teaching me a lot of like their culture and their ways and stuff because it's forgotten and it, they're actually like a really big bridge between um both like and ancestries yep and um they're i they're uh they're not recognized indigenous because i think that the colonizers know that that's like a key like they're a vital group between like a bridge between both people i think 
Yeah. So they erase them from history books, erase them from, like, it's really hard to even know about Taino people unless you, like, kind of know a Taino person, I guess. So yeah, that's yeah. just all I mean. And that right there, you know, that right fucking there, you know, um, them trying to them trying to erase Taino culture and Taino and, you know, people off of fucking history books, um, off of um, um, ge um, getting rid of them even even fucking existing. There are literally misconceptions. Like what? Like um, like if you were if you were to literally search up Taino people, there are like some they're results still here that... today. Yeah, they're not exactly. like extinct or whatever. Exactly. Like... And hell, still, even the, oh, sorry, they're still here through their millions of descendants from the Caribbean. Yeah. They are, why do you think Boricua has its name? So the yep. fact that they're going to continue erasing the Taino people is just so funny to me. And also, um, the descendants of the Taino people also have to fight with, um, uh, southern natives and northern natives yes on the yes and sister that's why that's what i've been i've been saying like um they're discredited a lot right. by indigenous people so they have two it's kind of like a fucked up colonizer trick on both both people you know but it's like practical right, colonialism right. yeah it's like a divide and um a lot of natives indigenous people fall for that you know but I actually yep. have a Taino sister who's been teaching me a lot of like specific cultural ways that are pretty pretty similar to indigenous along the coastal and also yeah. along to Caribbean, like um all those islands and stuff, all like it's like a it's like a uh, I think it's like a big strong group of people that bridge the gap and colonizers were onto that and they like tried to erase them all the way and cause yep. a cause a feud between indigenous people and African people, you know? Right. Yep. And it still leads on to this day. It's and like, not right there. Uh, oh, sorry. No, I was I was about to say, um, you know, the fact that Boricuas and um, other descendants of the Daino people of the islands have to fight for years in order to be recognized by Southern natives on the mainland, by Northern natives on the mainland. Yes, ma'am. Yes, yes, uh, yes. Yep. What quantum bullshit that native people never even had. We They never practiced any of that until the Spaniards came, until the Italians came. So like the fact that they had to fight for years in order to get some sort of recognition from other native peoples on the mainland is is a clear cut example of the psychological warfare that has been done yep. by European colonizers on yes. the peoples of this continent in the islands and you know on the mainlands. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And and not a lot of people know, but there are still Taíno people who live on Key West. There are still Taíno people who live in Southern Florida. The um the ancestral homes of um of the Taíno people weren't just weren't just the Caribbean. It was also Southern Florida, as well. You can still find Taíno people there to um to to this very fucking day. Exactly because um the coast of what is now Florida and the Caribbean islands were right next to each other, so yep. it's no surprise that the Taínos have history in modern day South Florida. But the fact you know. In you know, in fabricated terms, you know, the so-called state of Florida, you know, everyone trying to jump ship because things has gotten too bad. Like, you know, everyone, you know, jump ship, you know, leave Florida, you know, boycott Florida, but they don't understand. They don't see the revolutionary history. You don't see the cultural history beyond so-called Florida being a, a quote unquote state. Yep. You understand the, these are the land of the Dinos as well. The Seminole yep. people, and um, other peoples as well that were imperialized by the Spaniards that they tried to completely um, erase. So the fact that, um, you know, that the Dainos have history in modern day South Florida, um, I mean, you can still find those people there. I mean, there are other indigenous um, uh, communities in Florida. There are Mayan communities in Florida. 
Um, there are uh, Chicano, uh, other Chicano communities in Florida. So they have not left. They did not go extinct. They're just, they're still here, but many of them are psychologically European. They are psychologically yep. white because once again, of that psychological um, warfare that the colonizers did. Trying yep. to turn native people against each other, to turn um, indigenous Africans, okay. uh, native peoples here, because Africans aren't indigenous people as well, but we largely don't see ourselves as such because we've been so racialized, because we've been so gendered, and because we have been so stripped from our, from our destiny, from our history, from our homelands and to try to turn indigenous Africans against indigenous peoples here on this continent. I mean, I mean, you see it on social media, you know, everywhere, you know, um, the ethnocentric, um, you know, yep. ethnocentric gate, you know what I'm saying? But they don't quite understand why some uh, uh, descendants of indigenous Africans are claiming as being completely native to this continent and not from Africa at all because of that psychological genocide that has happened um, when they uh, got um, uh, five native groups to become quote unquote civilized, even though they already were, and engage in the enslavement of indigenous Africans and making them uh, think that they are a completely different people than yeah. what they are, regardless if they have um, native roots or not. You know, it doesn't matter because once again, it's a psychological warfare. Right, like I can't you know? be mad at them, you know? Once like you, I still have to. Yeah. That's that's I, the hard I, part about I, it. I'd be mad at them because I know. Like, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm like, yeah. you know, like, I deal with this shit all the time. And to me, <laughs> it makes angry for the same reason like like indigenous people are angry at like their people for denying their history and their ancestry and their roots like at the end of the day yeah i believe it was some black people over here you know what I'm saying? but yeah. majority of us like we got to keep it real we came from africa like we got to be proud of our african roots and stuff you know i can trace my african roots back to the continent I can trace my African roots back to slave plantation. You know, I even know the slave master name, George Hardiman. You know what I mean? He owned on my maternal grandmother's side. You know what I mean? But that right there, I think, is taking on a, co a colonial settler type of approach by denying indigenous people their heritage over here and trying to make it seem like only black people was inhabitants over here with the original inhabitants over here. And that's just dividing us. You know what I'm saying? We all oppressed. <laughs> like, no matter how we, the ones right. that was over here, right. the ones that came over in slavery, like, we all oppressed by the same motherfucking capitalist. Right, fuck the bullshit. It's all, we're all oppressed. Yeah, yep. We're all fucked. We're all fucked. <laughs> <laughs> that's we're why all we all supposed to be the united the most. Uh, this, this isn't, <laughs> I've said before, and I'll say it again, this isn't a race struggle. This isn't, this isn't a straight versus queer struggle. This isn't a man versus woman struggle. This isn't a neurotypical versus neurodivergent struggle. This is a class it's struggle. Class. It's class. Every, everything everything is rooted back to class. Everything. Every, it's all rooted back to it. Thing. Every Racism. Single, I'm sorry. Every single thing. You know, fat, you know, fat people are not trying to take over, you know, the so-called thin people because you have to understand um, health is also a class struggle as well, yep. um, bodily speaking, um, especially with our ancestors. I mean, we knew we knew what grew out from the ground. We knew what we ate. We know what we didn't eat. We knew what was in our um, in our resources. We knew what was in our resources and what wasn't. So the fact that um, they make fat people out to be, you know, like a detriment shows you how much um, warfare has been done to make fatness um, into, it, it's like they demonized 
our bodies and made and put our bodies on this on, on a class hierarchy no no matter if we're quote unquote healthy or quote unquote unhealthy because that's not the question the question is class it's a yep. class anti-fatness is a class struggle anti-fatness is a class struggle it's you know, systemic it's it's you know, that it's it's class warfare and so it's very important for us to expand beyond you know just what we you know you know what our skin is because <laughs> it's more than that it's our True. it's the social cultural and physical made political i've and never order. i've not, honestly never thought of that yeah yep. See how about the fatness true. part because i just so concentrated on you know what i mean right. i mean hey you know i mean hey i mean but that's why we're here um, yep I mean, hey, within um within within the system, you know, um um within within the patriarchal misogynistic within the misogynistic system, the standard of beauty that is always pressed on everyone is a is a flat, skinny, um blue eyed blonde hair Western U- U- European lady, literally. That's yeah. really the, the be- that's literally the, the fucking beauty standard. It, it so it's so fatness isn't just ju- ju- just rooted. Um, fatness doesn't just have its roots in the patriarchal misogynistic system. It's also interlinked with racism as well. Everything, right. everything, everything is interconnected. Yeah, it's, it's cultural imperialism. It's it's yep. the reason why everybody on here at one point most likely has struggled with their ethnicity you know what i'm saying mm-hmm. uh i talk about it in my autobiography like oh, uh, when i moved out to the suburbs like I, I i started to you know put like this in my family i use one example in my family like uh my grandfather like he was a racist against black people <laughs> like he yeah. had internalized inverse uh in, in uh, uh reverse racism against us like darker skinned people was not as acceptable as lighter skin. I was always the right color. So like my grandfather <laughs> was always cool with me. But he used to get whoopings all the time because he dark skinned. Uh yeah. he used to also this is why I have a problem with the uh the ones that always try try to like uh like disregard our African roots and stuff is because in our family like they told us we was uh Blackfoot uh Native American. You know what I'm saying? Indigenous and then when my uh, cousin did the uh, DNA stuff, she found out, like, we don't even have no indigenous nothing in our bloodline. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we we all came from Africa. You know what I'm saying? And for me, the way that was uh, projected in our family, it made us hate our African roots. Like, I, I'm not going to say my auntie name, but I remember one time we had a conversation. Remember, she was a substitute teacher for history. I brought up the fact that one of my cousins uh, traced the slant, uh, 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 landing slave trade uh, uh, went over to Africa. She went over to Africa, and I brought up that. And when I brought up Africa, she was like, Africa? You know what I mean? Like, ugh. I'd rather talk about our Irish uh, our Irish ancestry and stuff, which we do have Irish in us. You know what I'm saying? A small portion, though. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep. But yeah. she was more fascinated <laughs> about that than she was about our uh, African ancestry. So in our family, they use this Blackfoot uh, indigenous bloodline as as a way to like emphasize, uh, to de-emphasize our Africanness right. you know right. mm-hmm. in our family. So that that to me is like self-hate, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yep, so some that's these, racism. Yeah, some of these groups that's out here pushing that stuff you know what I'm saying? I feel like it's coming from self-hate, too. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got to yep. know. I, I take pride in, and I feel like we all should take pride in our history, our ethnicity, and stuff like that. But it should never turn into identity politics. Because yep, once never. it does turn into identity identity politics, then we won't even be able to unite amongst us, the most colonized people. You know what I'm yep. saying? So that's that's should be our main conversation when we have with these comrades in our communities 
that's trying to divide us based on identity politics. You did well say that, yeah, yep. I'm not denying the fact I believe there were Africans yep. here. You did what I'm saying? They came here and they Bigger lived picture. for a long time. But let's keep it real. Uh, to say that we didn't all come, uh, to, to say that we all were here first, get the fuck out of here. Like, that's that not real. That makes no sense. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's denying our African ancestors that said where they came from. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So that's my only problem with that because I feel like it's dividing us, the colonized. You know what I'm saying? We, indigenous, Cuban, African, uh, uh, Tainos. You know what I'm saying? I was just thinking about this, Gabby. You might have uh, Taino in you because Taino people were in Cuba as well. They they yeah. were like the principal uh, indigenous populations over in Cuba and the Caribbean as a whole, yeah, and, as a whole. and Haiti, right. Cuba, right. etc. Right, yeah, no, yeah. Um, I don't know if I showed you. Um, I don't know if I if I if I showed you, but I think I sent you. I think I sent you the, the picture of it saying that the likelihood of me be of me having Taino ancestry is really high. You know, because 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 I, like I was saying, um, the Taino people were the primary indigenous group within the Caribbean and Southern Florida. Obviously, there were other um, indigenous ethnic groups, but the Tahino people were the primary indigenous group in the, Carib in the Caribbean, from the, gr fr fr from, um, from the Great Antilles to the Lesser Antilles, all across the fucking board. And so, and so, um, and so that's why I keep on emphasizing that, that Cuban culture is African and indigenous culture. It has its roots in African and indigenous. It has its roots in in new African and Taino and Taino culture. Because if I remember correctly, um, as enslaved Africans were being were, were being brought from West Africa to Cuba, um, some of them rebelled and, and managed to take over um, a slaver ship. And they landed in the harbor of Cuba, and they and they fled to the mountaintops, and then another, and then and then that's where they met uh, um, some Taíno people who were also fleeing from from, um, from from colonialism from the Spanish Empire, who also fled to the mountaintops, and that's where those and that's where th those two cultures met, and that's where they intermingled, and that's where and that's where um, and that's where um, African traditions. And Taino traditions start, start start to merge together and and birth a new culture, you know, a new a new culture of, of resilience, of liberation, and um and of self um de determination, you know, um so right on and and it fucking it it just it just I am um, it just sorry I'm just trying to say it it just fills me with so much anger how you try and fucking whitewash and how you try and fucking discredit. The African roots with um with um within cultures, um in the Caribbean because I don't know if it's a problem where you guys are at, but I have literally seen, I have literally seen, um 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 African um new African people in in, in my high school telling other new African people who are Caribbean they say um they um they say you're not African you're Hispanic, you're you're not indigenous you're Hispanic. They they even tell me I'm not I'm not white I'm Hispanic I'm like what the fuck <laughs> they were like what what sense does that fucking make that makes no fucking sense Hispanic is a fucking race it's a fucking ethnic group it just it just pisses yeah. me the fuck off it's a lot of ignorant people because uh, I agree with Subi Toro the uh, chairman with the uh, for the New Era Young Lords yep. the Caribbean and South American cultures. They preserve African culture more yeah. than American black exactly. culture over here. So that's a fact. That is uh, a fact. Yeah, Puerto Rican, uh, Dominican, uh, Cuban, like a Brazilian, totally like Trinidadian, Panamanian, but like, all the Caribbean, Ecuadorian, all, and South yeah. America because uh, more of the slaves was actually brought to the Caribbean and South America than that was brought here. But a lot of yep. people in America, Blacks in America, and Americans in general, don't know that. You know what I'm saying? They think they have a monopoly over 
what it means to be black. <laughs> you feel exactly. me? That's, that's exactly. That's a class problem and, too. That's a class problem too. You have yeah. um, you have neo colonialism uh, right there. Fucking okay, neo colonialism. Yeah. yeah, you have you in this class struggle. In this example, you have new Africans or the so-called foundational black Americans at the top. And then you have the you have those of African descent in the Caribbean, in uh, Mexico, in Central America, in South America, at the all America. Yeah. So they, you know, the the so-called foundational black American thinks that, you know, they have made everything African or so-called black on this continent and that, you know, we were the only ones to make hip hop and, you know, and because of that, we have, you know, full authority over every other person of African descent on this continent. And that is false. Yep. That is false. That is a class problem, too. You know, yep. revising history, um, revising history on purpose, you know, to escape, especially to escape the reality of their own oppression, because you do because they do understand that being foundational does not protect them from being oppressed at all. No matter how hard they assimilate, no matter how hard they try, because they are in this too. It's yep. everyone. It's they'll everyone. They'll never be. They'll it's never be accepted. Boils, Sorry. Yeah. This all boils down to one thing: like we have to stop. We eventually, within our movement, have to have our own liberation schools that teach a true history, because mm -hmm. these schools right here, we're gonna leave out of these schools with a colon a colonized mindset. And that's what's reflected in a lot of people in this uh in the population, not just uh with black, like a lot of the white. Exactly. Let's look at the white population. A lot of them think they can write everything. You know what yep. I'm saying? They yep. don't know. They don't know how uh like they got their Plato and Aristotle from black people over in Africa that preserved those writings and shit. You know what I'm saying? They don't understand what the indigenous, the various different indigenous uh. Uh, ethnic uh, groups, yeah, ethnic groups. All the contributions they made to history, the Asians, the Arabs. You know what I'm saying? Like they weren't the creators of civilization. You know what I'm saying? But that mm. is only because we all send our kids to colonialized schools, colonized schools, colonial schools. That's going to give us a colonial education. Once we yep. take back the institutions. You know what I'm saying? We'll be able to educate people and we'll be able to get over this identity politics bullshit that they're using in, in a class struggle to keep us divided. You know what I'm saying? So these type of conversations that we have in these uh, uh, book readings is, is very informational. It's very educational. It's raising political consciousness and it's uniting us. You know what I'm saying? Especially the most colonized within our movement. You know what I'm saying? Like right. we don't always have each other's back because we know the truth and we understand yep. the class struggle. You feel me? Everything everything comes back to the primary contradiction between the proletariat and the bourgeois. First came the idea of profit, then came the idea of slavery and, and racism. First came the idea of profit, then came the idea of misogyny, and so on and so forth. You know, it all comes back to profit. It all comes back. It all comes back to, to the privatization, commodification, and um, and hoarding of the wealth and resources of our labor, of the bourgeois. It all comes back to that. You know, so um, so right on. And we have to fucking everyone across the board. You know, we have to fucking decolonize. Our, we have to decolonize, decolonize ourselves. We have to understand the true history. Oh, sorry. Um, everything okay? Oh, sorry. Um, but yeah, we, we have to decolonize. We have to decolonize ourselves across the board, and it and disgusts me how they fucking try um, through whitewashing, demonization, dehumanization, try to um, assimilate, try to. Um, I'm trying. I'm trying to give colonized people a whitewashed, white supremacist, bourgeois way of viewing uh, of history to embolden reactionary sentiments, bolster white supremacist groups' in individualistic behavior, and, exactly. uh, and 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 to try and pin colonized people against against one another by, by giving by giving each one um a, a different type type um, um, type of bullshit. You know, they 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 try and get 
each one a different a different whitewashed um white supremacist history to try and fucking um turn um tur- turn one colonized group against the other instead of them trying to see th- 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 that the people who are doing this are the bourgeois not not themselves you know right and it's just fucking God, it's just it, fucking it, sad, it, and that's why that's why lot. political education is so important. That's why we have to. That's why we have to engage in cultural revolution and mass line and building these survival programs, building these institutions, building exactly. a new culture, building um new institutions of liberation, showing people how to self govern, how to self govern th- themselves. Show people, show people what it means to be a revolutionary. Show people wh- what sovereign. it means. Yep. To be sovereign, and that yep. is been, that's exactly why I'm making my liberation school because I am sick and tired of these systems existing. Even after all that we've been through, through blood, through sweat, and through tears, through our minds, you know the oppression that we have faced by these systems. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of having my wife beat up in the guillotine by a quote unquote public education system. It's not even a system. It's a factory complex. That is what yep. to make us ignorant, to make us uh, prostitutes to capitalism, you know, to be those. And I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of there no being um, any so, uh, survival programs, no uh, no sense of destiny, uh, no, no uh, putting our foot down once and for all and say this is enough what can we actually do you know it's kind of like a lot of gave in and i'm tired of it and i'm and with this liberation school i'm stopping that cycle once for all with my own people with my own young folks because right this, on. Needs to stop. this needs to stop all the excuses oh my generation should have you know should have done better that's that on you because you because you were around when the crack crisis happened, you were around when the AIDS crisis happened. Y'all watched and caused it. Capitalism just caused it. They didn't watch, and all these excuses, the uh, pointing the finger, the blame game. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I've been in the public school system for my entire non-existent childhood, really. So, Same. like, I'm like, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of having our lives up in the guillotine by um by bougie forces by uh pigs that think that what is best for us is stealing our history um you know having full control over our bodies over our history and i'm tired of it i'm tired of it and i'm a 19 year old saying this i'm sick of it i'm sick of it i'm tired of it i'm tired of being oppressed i am tired I am tired of having my wife be up in the guillotine by nine people and become all types of racial slurs by, in, in front of everyone by nine people. I'm sick mm-hmm. of it. And so it's time for us to put our foot down once again and retell our own history to each other. Our history, African history, Puerto Rican history, Irish history, you know, um, Wanch history. That's what we want to teach to each other because that is mm-hmm. who we are. Not all these uh, labels that they placed on us in order to have col- colonialism and capitalism going. I'm tired of it. I'm sick of it. Enough is enough. I mean, we just had um, a mass shooting um, with uh, three new Africans in Jacksonville yesterday. That is what happens when we ignore our reality. This happens. And we don't know how to organize. We don't know how to fight. We don't know how to analyze. That is what has led us to right now. Because we don't know how to fight. We don't know how to hear our ancestors' voices. So that's why I'm making the school because I am tired of my people dying. I'm tired of us dying. I'm tired of us being killed. I'm tired of having our not right to be up in the guillotine by 3,000 people. I'm tired of it, and that stops now. It stops now. Because this can't go on. Y'all know this is not normal. This is not normal at, for anyone. 
for our earth, for our nature, for the ground that we walk on. Y'all know this is not normal. But that's okay because I'm going to stop this cycle once and for all. Because this needs to end. All of this needs to go. All of this needs to go. All power. All power. Right fucking all. Power on. Because, like, it's time. It's time. It's been time, but it, it's, it's that it's, it's permanent. There's no hiding anymore. No hiding anymore. No hiding behind our so-called allies. We don't have allies. You have comrades. You have those on your side and those not on your side. And that's what we need to focus on. Being comrades. Not having people that benefit off our oppression to, you know, hide behind and fight for us. No. There's no hiding anymore. And I won't tolerate it. There's no more hiding. Now we right have to deal with reality, whether we like it or not. That's what Fred Hampton said, right? Yeah. That's what Fred Hampton said, right? We're supposed we to be dialectless. We deal yep. with reality whether we like it or not. We deal with That's it. what's fucking up. Exactly. As Fred Hampton said, oh, sorry. As Fred Hampton that, said, yeah. As Fred, as Fred Hampton said, um, theory is cool, but theory without practice ain't shit. You can say all you want, but but you just have to be a day. Yup, boots on the ground. That's what we have to do. That's what we need to do right here, right right now. This right shit now. needs to stop. As a species, as a species, not only can we do better, we need to do better because if this shit continues, we are all going to die. Yeah. Capitalism is destroying life on fucking earth. And if we don't do something about it, everything that we love, everything that we cherish, everything that we care about is going to fucking die all because a couple of people want um, want more money. That's fucking sad. That's fucking pathetic and and abhorrent as fuck. That can't fucking continue. We need a new society with a new socioeconomic system, with new social relations, with a new culture. We need and to it. uphold <laughs> and to uphold the revolutionary liberation liberation line. That's we what we it. have to do. We we need that now. And if they're not gonna do it, then I will. If they're not gonna stop that cycle, I will. Right if on. They're not, if, the, if they're not going to know who they are, I will. For my right own. On. We're supposed to focus on young people anyway. That's the point. Not these elders that are so far gone, and we have to keep relying on them. No. No, 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 no. They're just a guide. We are the front faces. We are the furious faces carrying on that torch. And we have a responsibility for new language, for um our for all parts of history to be taught with new um inclusive language that makes sense for us, not what their generation says for us now. And for and the next generation. Exactly. All right. I'm going to have to go, comrades. Uh, but this was a great discussion. I got uh, I can't interview tonight. Then I got to go to work, so I need to get some sleep. But great uh, discussion. <laughs> Pleasure being right on comrades. And I love y'all, all parts of the people. All, all powers of the people. Uh, people. Can I... Um, um, can I... Um, can I say something that I wrote? If that's okay? Yeah, sure. 